and um, and uh, if our phone's ready, we'll get started. All right. Um, hello and welcome everyone to SIP Groningen, the Dutch United Nations Student Association. Um, we organize lectures every Monday on a variety of topics related to international affairs, um, among which tonight's lecture on or discussion on uh, the European arms trade or rather European militarization. Uh, we'll shortly be joined by uh, Mr. Ludo Heckman, a journalist and reporter from Lighthouse Reports, um, who is here to um, share with us a bit about uh, what he has gathered from his years working with the topic of um, European arms trafficking and various related topics. Um, thank you so much, Ludo, for joining us. Um, Thanks I will... for inviting. Good to be here. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll just shortly introduce you, uh, introduce the topic, uh, introduce Lighthouse Reports, and then we can get started. Um, essentially, for all of you in the audience, we'll be using a SlimeWatch Q&A format. Um, I'll be proposing several topics to uh, Ludo, and we will have a discussion of sorts. But if you have any questions throughout the uh, discussion, feel free to send them in. Um, to me via chat or just put them in the chat for everyone to see. If you want to participate in the discussion, you can also comment and we'll take your comments into account. If you're on um, YouTube, you can also uh, put any uh, questions or comments in the live stream chat and uh, I will read them out as well. Um, but without further ado, um, Ludo Heckman, who's joining us today, is uh, the co-founder or a co-founder of Lighthouse Reports. He is a journalist, uh, editor, who has worked as a correspondent in uh, countries like Iran and Iraq. Uh, he's also previously worked in Afghanistan, but since about four years, I believe, or perhaps five, uh, he's been working as, well, uh, the chief editor of uh, Lighthouse Reports. Lighthouse Reports itself is a media non-profit organization, which is based in Amsterdam. Um, which hosts for a variety of journalists, um, editors, etc., cetera, um, people involved and interested in, well, important topics around the world, from arms trade, our current topic, to issues of climate change, corruption, etc. cetera. Um, and they're open to anyone. So if you want to get involved, always feel free to send them a message if I'm correct, or at least that's the message I've gathered from your website, Ludo. Definitely. Yeah. Always open for uh, suggestions. Great. Um, so just to start it off, I wanted to ask you a bit about, um, well, how exactly Lighthouse Reports got started and when it started getting involved in reporting on the arms trade. Um, in 2018, I believe you started a series of reports on different European countries and their arms trafficking industries or arms trading industries. Uh, you covered seven countries in total. The first one you covered was the Netherlands. You also covered um, Spain most recently. And in between that, Belgium, France, Germany, and the UK and Denmark were also covered. Um, how do you come up with the idea, first of all, to co-found Lighthouse Reports? And why did you start reporting on the European arms trade? Um, yeah, so there's uh, two really big Big questions, um, and the first one uh, mainly has to do with um, um, our role as a journalist in the current uh, media landscape, um, and the second one has to do uh, on selecting what kind of topics we think are important to follow. So, starting with the first one, um, as you said, I was a, um, a journalist, a freelance journalist, working for different um, Dutch media outlets. Uh, mostly for Middle Eastern countries and Iran. Um, one of the issues that you maybe know, if you are a freelance journalist, it's really hard to uh, um, to make a living. Uh, that's one thing. And secondly, you are. Um, it's really hard to do in-depth um, investigations because this is time-consuming. And if you want to um, um, make a bit of a living, you have to produce a lot of stories, and uh, which basically means uh, you make um, quick stories or uh, easy to uh, easy to write stories. And um, 
me and a colleague that I often worked with um, were um, after a while a bit disappointed uh, on what we could do. There were so many stories in front of us and uh, so many ideas, but it was hard to, um, to realize them. And um, what happened, we started working together and we were looking for a way to um, make our journalistic work um, more profitable. But by doing so, we drifted away a bit into another sector, which more has to do with um, um, educational um, uh, books and educational uh, um, uh, projects. Um, so we decided after a while, um, this is also not what we want to do. So being a freelance reporter was not something that was very fulfilling in the end. Uh, drifting away to another sector was also uh, something we didn't want to do. So we started to rethinking how it's possible in these days to do a real in-depth, original, investigative uh, journey. And there are several ways at the moment. And one of them is by uh, looking for um, independent funders. Um, the last few years, um, it's more and more usual for the philanthropical institutions to also fund journalism. So we started a basically in um, a Stichting. So we call it in the Netherlands. It's, it's the kind of NGO, uh, but we really we don't want to we don't call ourselves an NGO because we we, we really want to be um, independent. Or we don't have a agenda um, apart from being uh, independent investigators. Um, so we started this independent organization, and it's now mainly. Um, 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 uh, funded by um, philanthropic uh, money, so by funders, um, and that that make, make uh, makes it possible for us to follow what we think is really interesting, and to sometimes invite other people um, that have other skills or other uh, other information um, knowledge that we don't have, and also to take the time to do real um, real in depth uh, investigations. Um, so that's a short history, uh, which explains a bit um, why we are where we are at the moment, and why we are organized in a um, in an, in a, a nonprofit a stichting. Yeah, very interesting. Um, the contributions you've made since fi founding Lighthouse Reports are well quite significant, I believe. You've um, contributed to reports by Bellingcat, various Dutch news media publications, etc. Um, so although you've switched from doing fast reporting and not being able to do things in depth, you have, have you achieved what you aim to start out with? It seems like you have from the outside, but yeah. from more your perspective as well. Um, yeah, no, the, the, the honest answer is that we, uh, uh, we did. Um, I think what we can do at the moment as Lighthouse is, um, is what I really want to do. It's um, it's it's independent. It's um, it's um, it's about the topics that we really care about, and it's the kind of ambitious journalism that needs a team. So it's you can do it on your own, but with the um, with the current way of organizing lighthouse, we are able to um, to make teams, to invite people, and to work with the uh, major um, platforms all over Europe. So. Um, yeah, I'm very um, content with uh, how things are going at the moment. Yeah. And so then when it came specifically to your um, you arms uh, trade yeah. um, well, story, especially, or your newsroom, I believe you call it, um, yeah. how did that start out? Um, and yeah, how did you, how'd you come about to doing something as ambitious as tracking all of European arms? Yeah. Um, the very first start was when I was reading a book from um, a well-known politician from South Africa, Andrew Feinstein. Um, he was a politician for the ANC in, uh, in South Africa and he had to leave because he wasn't um, following the official line of uh, uh, ANC anymore. And when he left, he took a lot of the um, evidence for um, um, uh, arms trafficking in South Africa with him. And South Africa is an important uh, hub for, um, for arms, uh, arms dealers. So when he took all the evidence, he had a um, beautiful insight into the global uh, arms trafficking, illegal arms trafficking. And he wrote an impressive book about it uh, called The Shadow World, 
and later he made a documentary about it. Both I can recommend um, to you very much if you are interested in the, in the topic. Um, it's it's very well documented and um, and and nice written. It's full of beautiful characters, so it's it's a great story. Uh, but the thing was, I knew that the Netherlands was a big player at, for um, uh, in in relative terms for um, in the arms industry. Um, but uh, when I read the book from Andrew Feinstein, there was only one mention. Um, one time, uh, the Netherlands was mentioned in relation to um, Prince Bernhard, um, with, um, one of the people from the uh, royal family. Um, there was a scandal, some corruption and arms involved, but there was the only time when, uh, when the Netherlands was mentioned. And mm -hmm. since I knew that it was it was quite a big player, I wondered uh, what how is the how is the um, Dutch uh, arms trade um, organized and uh, who's involved and who's profiting. So I started to look around a little bit. And then there, there was an interesting um, um, contrast. If you if you look at uh, the Netherlands, and it 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 turns out to be uh, typical for the EU uh, at large, um, and that is that there are really clear uh, clear rules. So there is a very um, clear set of uh, criteria that you have to follow if you want to do responsible arms export. Uh, but at the same time, there are not many checks. So no, uh, there's not really um, a feedback mechanism. So people don't know whether um, what they what they agreed on on paper whether that really happens um, in reality. So arms, is, uh, arms are sold to uh, people all over the world, um, but whether they are resold to another country or whether they are used in a um, controversial uh, conflict or whether they are used for internal repression, all of these are criteria um, that we um, agreed on in the European Union, that that's a reason not to sell arms to another country, but whether this really happened um, or, or does not happen. We don't know. So um, that's where we came out, came up with the um, quite ambitious, indeed, um, idea. Let's let's start tracking. Let's try uh, try to find out where the Dutch arms are ending up. Yeah. Not only the Netherlands, but also several other countries. Um, I just want to share yeah. with our audience the track and trace um, map that you made uh, with, as Lighthouse reports um, only briefly. This um, diagram you can find on uh, euarmstrade.com, uh, a website set out by Lighthouse Reports, which includes all of the different trades made by uh, various countries in Europe. Um, specifically, you can follow uh, well, different lines of uh, tracking of how things, weapons end up in Yemen via Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and various other countries have directly sometimes via Spain um, and all around the world, specifically going into depth uh, with certain countries. So it's essentially a track and trace as we would for our uh, post mail here in the Netherlands, but then for European arms trafficking. Um, yep. How did you make this map in particular is something I wanted to ask, because it's one of the more interesting things I found when looking into your reports. Um, yeah, um, it's um, after a while we we started looking at um, at uh, deals starting in the Netherlands, but later indeed uh, we went to Germany, France, and all the other countries, and we started to track uh, deals one by one. So, for example, we knew that the Netherlands sold um, I don't know howitzers to the UAE, so we we tried to um, find out how the UAE has used these howitzers. So then that's one one line in the map. And after a while, we, uh, we, find, we just realized that we have a lot of information, but it's really hard to digest. It's really hard to get an overview. So we asked the developer to, um, to make it into an interactive uh, map. So it's just a way to, um, to make people understand um, how many deals, how many exports are we are talking about. And this is only just a part of it because it's only the deals that we've been investigating. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it gives you um, a sense of the amount of um, arms that are leaving uh, Europe. Mm, absolutely. The sheer immensity and also they get re-exported. Um, you mentioned that you could, for example, track how to wherever they went from Germany, let's say, to Saudi Arabia, to Yemen or a different conflict. Um, how come do you think that 
companies themselves and uh, well in Dutch you'd say the the Antonari, the middlemen and the government weren't doing this already um, if it, they clearly violated the commitments that European countries have made themselves yeah. when you were able to and the governments didn't? Um, I think there are a few different answers possible to, uh, to the questions. One of them, maybe it's not in their interest to spend a lot of time and money in uh, finding out what happens to their arms because it, because it can only create problems, right, for their um, for the industry, uh, but also for their diplomatic relations with the country um, that they're looking into. So there's not a, there's not a really um, powerful incentive to follow where your um, arms are ending up. I think that's an important one. And secondly, and I think that might be um, uh, sincere as well, but um, what they think is it's, it's impossible. Um, it's really hard once you ship it and it is out of your, um, out of your control, it's impossible to, um, to follow what, what's really happening. And one of the reasons is because they always um, think that if you want to control, you have to go somewhere and you have to check their um, uh, military bases to see whether the tanks are still there or whether they are sold to another country maybe. And of course, uh, not many countries will allow um, diplomats or um, um, officials from another country in their military bases. I mean, that's, that's about your sovereignty, it's about your defense of your country. So um, if you ask um, as the Netherlands, if you can come to Saudi Arabia to check whether their, um, I don't know, their tanks are still in the, in the right place, they will probably uh, laugh and say, uh, well, um, um, leave me alone. Um, so it's a matter it's of state sovereignty. You can't interfere with that as a journalist or yeah, for an actor. Yeah. So that's hard. That's hard. It's possible in, in, in their um, opinion. But um, only um, three, I think maybe three or four years ago, the whole um, uh, movement of um, independent open source intelligence uh, came came up. I'm not sure if you um, followed this a little bit, but that was the day. Uh, these were the days that um, Bellingcat um, started to uh, get uh, a bit more well known. And there, and as you probably all know, they are um, specialists in uh, online investigations. So yeah. if you have a laptop and an internet connection, you can find a lot of evidence for a lot of wrongdoing. If you know how to uh, how to dig, if you know where to look, if you know how to compare sources, etc. So we um, um, we already knew some people at Bellingcat, so we decided to work together and see if we could use their methods to track and trace where um, the Dutch arms were ending up. Mm. Um, and that turned out super interesting. So based on that um, kind of pilot in the Netherlands, we decided to, um, to do the same in the other countries and uh, basically used open source intelligence to, um, to check and to try to find out where um, European arms were ending up. Yeah, I mean, myself, I've been using the live UI map since mm. uh, live universal awareness map since about 2014 to track conflicts. So I imagine yeah. doing a similar method to trace arm street things would also be very doable. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There, um, there are, it's, it's a very good source and there are uh, a lot of those sources. And if you just use them and uh, and take the time, I mean, it's, it's really time consuming, but if you... Uh, if you, if you can't take the time, then there's a lot to find out. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Paul Bucker already asked a question, which, who's, uh, to, um, there's a lot of activity in Djibouti. I believe most of the activity uh, ends up in Yemen or across the sea in Eritrea before going to Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Do you believe, did you um, see a lot of arms exports to Djibouti or was it mostly um, with Yemen? Um, not, I think Djibouti is, um, there's a lot of American troops in, uh, in Djibouti. There's a very big American uh, base, if I'm mm. not mistaken. And, um, um, so Djibouti itself is not a destination. Um, there might be it's a lot a of, um, yeah, yeah. It, it, exactly. And, and there's probably a lot of, uh, US, um, um, I don't know, US equipment and US uh, people. And they bring their own um, arms, probably. And the U.S. mostly has their own um, um, their own facilities to produce uh, vessels and uh, airplanes, etc. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, if I might add to that, um, one of the spots you can you can actually see. I mean, so I just share again. Um, I myself know a little bit about um, well military industries in the region. 
A lot of them mm-hmm. end up in Assab, which is a port owned yeah. by a military base owned by the UAE. Uh, yeah. Before that, they used to have a base in Djibouti, but they got into a slight kerfuffle with um, Djibouti uh, military um, high-ranking officers. Essentially, they had a falling out. Um, so while Djibouti used to be a high a base for um, arms exports because they, um, well, arms imports and then going across the region to different conflicts um, because of the US base, because of the UAE base, because of the French base there, it's now become slightly less important in the region. Yeah. 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 And but, um, is indeed a super interesting place, especially with the conflict in Yemen. Yeah. Uh, also, just Eritrea itself and its um, well, humanitarian issues, uh, to say yeah. the least. Yeah. Um, but Paul's question actually does, uh, well, lead me to a different one, which is um, about European involvement uh, in Yemen in particular. Um, lots of the things, uh, lots of the arms deals I went through on your website ended up there. And I'm just wondering uh, if you have any insight as to whether um, European companies are intentionally getting involved in uh, Yemen, whether they have any interests there, um, or if it's all just mainly via Saudi Arabia and the UAE, or if there's also direct exports from European countries to Yemen. No, there is not much, um, <clears throat> not, not much direct uh, export to uh, to Yemen. Um, so the. Um, um, we have, of course, uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia who are supporting one side, and they bring all their equipment from uh, from their own um, imports. Um, and the other side, the Houthi um, people, they're mostly mostly getting their um, um, equipment from uh, Iran, um, um, if they have any. Um, so it's mostly um, um, from the UAE and uh, from Saudi Arabia. And is it, if it, is it intentionally? No, I don't think um, um, they they sell it so that it can be used. E- even maybe the opposite. The um, Saudi Arabia has not been involved in a war for a very long time. It's only since uh, 2015 that they have this war with Yemen. But before, they didn't they didn't use that. They they bought a lot of equipment. They bought a lot of military um, stuff over the years. Um, but it was not; they were not involved in in a lot of proxy wars, or and they, so it was just um, uh, it was just somewhere in Saudi Arabia, and it was used, of course, for all kind of geopolitical um, arrangements, and um, and it was a way to buy um, loyalty from uh, from different uh, different countries, and and but it was a, a pretty safe um, situation. You could sell a lot of military equipment to the Saudi Arabia, and nothing would happen with it. And that all changed when the war in Yemen started, and um, and they actually were starting to use the, all the equipment they were using. Um, so I think for a lot of these companies, there, there was a pretty new situation, and they had to think about, um, they had to rethink in a way. I think uh, whether it was still okay to um, to sell uh, military equipment to uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. I, I don't think there's been a large change in that. Uh... However, um, one of the things you highlight in the start is that the European countries have made a commitment to not export um, arms to countries with humanitarian issues. But then about two months ago, you had uh, President Macron saying that France will continue uh, exporting uh, weapons to Egypt, regardless of its human rights issues. And the same goes for several other European countries with similar Uh, commitments to continuing arms trafficking despite humanitarian questions. Um, So is there even still such a commitment in place if France is the second, the, sorry, the third largest arms exporter in the world and it seems not to care for its importers um, human rights abuses? One of the reports on your website is about um, Cameroon in, in particular which I know mm-hmm. is a tremendous abuser of human rights in the Anglophone regions yeah. um, and also of other yeah. dissidents. So mm-hmm. is there really any um, yeah, room for humanitarian questions? 
Um, this is it's a really complicated uh, question, and I think it, um, it 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 depends a bit on the um, on your perspective and the and the country that you're uh, that you're looking at. Um, but maybe um, to start, so there is a there is a European. Uh, it's, it's called a common position. So it's a European agreement on how to um, um, how to do responsible arms exports. And this is something that all countries in Europe have to implement into their own law. So it's not law in itself. It's a uh, common position. But every European member state has to um, translate it into uh, domestic law. Um, and, and this already creates a bit of a difference between the different European countries. So some, some of them have, have a different system already or they, um, they, they decide to arrange it in a slightly different way than, than other countries. But also every country can make their own decisions in how to, um, how to weigh the, the, the different criteria in the, in the common position. So it leaves a lot of space for, um, for countries with uh, a small arms industry to be really strict and, and, and really um, um, careful and countries that, that depend more on their arms industry like France um, who um, are more um, uh, willing to um, um, yeah to, to sell to countries with a um, questionable um, history in um, humanitarian uh, uh, issues. So there is so that there is a big difference, and I think France is uh, the most um, um, is the how do you say in uh, proper English? Um, they care. They they don't really uh, they care um, uh, at least I think in 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 Europe about um, where to uh, where to sell, and um, they consider their arms industry as a really important part of their. Um, um, their, uh, the protection of their national uh, sovereignty and um, it's it's pretty close to the state in France. So there is also a lot of protection from the from the French state for the French military companies. So I believe that in it, um, in France the military complex is directly owned by the state, as whereas compared to Germany, the majority of military companies have been liberated. Yeah, yeah, true. So uh, French state is often a um, shareholder of the of the arms industry yeah. yeah do you think that allows for more direct control and well if they wanted to they could commit to um well the european commitments as for arms tra trading yeah i i don't think they often have more than 49 percent. so i don't think there is a there is official um majority um, influence on the, on the company um, but nonetheless, if you look at uh, European politics, um, it's it's really hard to to make serious progress, and that's mainly to do with um, with the position of uh, France on um, uh, on arms um, regulations. Mm -hmm. So it's really the France who don't want to um, um, step up their um, um, the criteria. And for yeah. example, there is a um, there is. Um, um, one German uh, EU um, member of parliament called Hannah Neumann. She was the um, rapporteur on um, uh, arms exports until recently. Um, and she really tried to um, focus on a, a way to get a more European-wide um, system of uh, control and checks and balances because now we have European regulations, but as I said, domestic implementation and so you really try to take this to the european level but this was impossible um because the um, the friends were not very willing to um, um go that direction interesting i did not know that at all it kind of adds to um alan's question in the, in the chat as well he asked um he commented on um, italy halting their arms straight to saudi arabia and so whether we could see something similar in the Netherlands or other European countries or EU countries. Um, you just said that France um, holds them back. Do you think that's the same in this case? Um, um, yeah, I'm sorry, what do you mean with this case? Well, Italy halting its arms trade to Saudi Arabia. Do you think yeah. France would hold its yeah. other European countries back from that? 
It's an interesting example. I'm not too sure. I didn't look in, in, in the details, but um, it's true that um, Italy stopped at least some of their exports. But I think if you look at um, the details, there might be a lot that can still go on. So I'm I'm pretty sure that that it's only a minor part of the arms export to Saudi Arabia that it will really be um, halted from uh, from now on, because um, Italy hasn't been very uh, willing to um, um, to be a responsible arms exporter um, as well. So it's only because there is a lot of um, legal um, um, pressure. So there was uh, like the there were a lot of cases going on in. Um, in Italy, um, that made pretty obvious that um, there were some limits to what they could do, and, and this might be um, one way to respond to these legal um, challenges that they were facing. But at the same time, we have this huge deal with uh, with Egypt. I think it's 13 billion that they just signed off a few weeks ago. Um, and if you look at Egypt, um, it's it's it's. It's a different uh, country uh, compared to Saudi Arabia, but there are many reasons why you should uh, rethink um, selling to uh, to Egypt, uh, mainly for their involvement in a war in Libya, but also because of the internal repression that is um, increasing in the last uh, five years. And if I'm not mistaken, Matthias, you know all about this. Yeah, having lived in Egypt myself, I would say that I do. I mean, it might also add its uh, abuses in um, Sinai and its yeah, tenuous yeah. relationships with uh, Ethiopia. If a country is yeah. now exporting to Egypt, then who knows what they might start up with the uh, current dam crisis in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you, um, interesting that you said that the Italian case is due to legal pressure, not to public pressure. Um, is that usually the case, that it's not people, the average citizens of a country, who push for these kinds of things, but the, it's the laws being applied? And legal? No, it's a good, um, I think it's a, it's a pretty recent um, trend that we are seeing. So, um, and um, there's in Europe, every um, every European member state has some NGOs that are focusing on the responsible arms trade, um, and they are really um, until recently they were focusing on the um, politicians, um, public debate, um, so the traditional way to mobilize. Um, 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 yeah, as, as citizens basically of, of the country to, um, um, to to think about uh, arms export and if they can to uh, find ways to to stop it by um, and mainly by uh, trying to convince politicians. Uh, but since a few years, um, more and more um, NGOs started to um, um, focus on um, strategic litigation. So so trying to use. Um, public um, uh, legal um, processes to um, stop arms exports, not not because there is public pressure, but because they have lawyers that can explain that there are laws in place and that they are not followed um, if a certain uh, license is um, granted or if a certain country is allowed as a destination for um, for arms. So I think um, it's uh, it's something pretty recent, and um, you can see it all over Europe that. Um, NGOs are um, trying to uh, start um, yeah, litigation uh, processes. Interesting. Um, I mean, that goes into um, the next question as well, if I may ask it for her. Um, she asked about uh, France signing and ratifying the arms trade treaty. Um, so since they have signed the arms trade treaty and have ratified it as well, um, well, does that mean that that can now be held above their head by such NGOs um, as a signal to their commitment um, to limiting the arms trade? Or is she correct? Or, or yeah, is there other assertion that it's more of a farce uh, correct? Um, no, but um, the, the ATT is a pretty recent uh, agreement. I think it's only 2014 or 15 since it came into force. Um, but it is um, it is um, binding. So um, if you if you find uh, a good legal argument, you can take it to a court, um, and you might be um, successful. Uh, of course, you will be um, uh, faced with uh, with very good lawyers from the uh, from the French state. Um, but it is possible to do. Um, it depends. Um, 
you you cannot just start a case. There there are different different conditions in different European countries um, to um, to start a case. And for example, I'm not sure about France, but in some countries you need to start the case um, on behalf of someone. So for so you need to find victims that are um, victim, uh, for example, in this case by um, by friends. Uh, military um, abuse of, of military um, stuff that they bought from uh, from France, um, which can be a bit complicated depending on the on the case. Um, and going to and Burkina Faso or Mali, where the French military is currently active and where it exports is difficult to say the least. Um, yeah, but but find people that were involved, uh, and you can you can prove that they were um, that they were harmed by. Um, um, by, I don't know, police from Burkina Faso, they were using French weapons. I mean, it's still quite a long way to um, um, to prove uh, to prove it. But in theory, it's possible. But I've, I don't know many cases that are successful until now um, that are um, based on the ATT. I know there is, there is there are a few more examples based on domestic laws in Belgium and now recently in Italy, but also in the Netherlands. And I know some people in France are also thinking about this. Um, so based on domestic laws, there are quite some examples of successful litigation, um, but based on the ATT, and I think it has to do with the fact that it's pretty, um, pretty young. I don't know. I don't know a lot of examples uh, mm. yet. But well, since it's pretty young, do you imagine a couple of years time or decades time? Who knows? We'll get something similar to the shell case in Nigeria, where you have an arms exporter being involved and being taken to court and it being successful as well. Um, but then for arms trafficking instead of for, uh, well, yeah. environmental abuses. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm, um, I can imagine it. I mean, of course, it all depends on uh, political uh, will. Um, uh, but I think I can, I can imagine that this something like this happening. Uh, at, there's a there's an NGO in um, in Berlin called ECCHR. They um, wrote an extensive communication to the ICC, uh, which focuses on um, arms exports from Europe that are used in Yemen, and that continued while um, all these countries knew that there was a, a horrendous war going on. Mm -hmm. um, and the communication is just the first step in an, in an, um, in. A, um, in the in the case at the, at the ICC, um, so it's no guarantee that it will be an actual case one day. But they wrote a really extensive communication with a lot of evidence, um, and I can at least imagine that the, that a case like this is uh, feasible in the in the near future. Yeah, hmm. no, that's interesting. Um, I mean, the war in Yemen is still ongoing, as far as I'm aware, and um, arms exports are also still continuing. Um, despite whatever cases may be brought to the ICC, I imagine, um, as long as that case is, will be running, um, if it even gets brought to court, that arms trade will still continue throughout. Um, well, I think in the, I think Yemen is a, is a good example where uh, you can see that um, arms export became um, controversial and um, was... Um, halted even in many in many cases so you, maybe you remember that uh, germany had a, um, a ban on arms exports to Saudi arabia um, <laughs> since i think one and a half year ago and um, and they are a big arms exporter i mean it's it's uh, it, it was really meaningful that they made the decision not to sell to Saudi arabia anymore and it, this um, this ban on arms exports to Saudi arabia from germany started with uh, the killing of khashoggi and um, so it was was not even related to yemen but they had to renew every six months the um, the, the ban on Saudi Arabia, and um, after one um, so one time six months, they decided to continue the ban. But then they referred also to the war in uh, in Yemen. So now it's hmm. it's basically the war in Yemen that um, that is a reason for Germany not to sell arms to Saudi Arabia and and the UAE. Um, and for the Netherlands, it's the same. The Netherlands is really um, careful for quite a few years already not to sell arms to Saudi Arabia. And there are many more examples. Um, so I think the, the Yemen is a, uh, is, I mean, you can always wonder whether this really made a difference on the ground, but at least you can see that there, um, that there were quite a few examples of uh, European uh, countries that stopped sending arms to Saudi Arabia and the UAE 
uh, because of the Yemen, uh, because of the Yemen war, so because of how the arms are used by uh, Saudi Arabia. So there is actual commitments there. I wasn't aware, um, although I had read uh, even a couple of months ago that vehicles were still being exported to um, and other similar non-direct combat um, uh, items were still being exported to Saudi Arabia. So even though from there Germany? is like a limitation, yes, from Germany. Yeah. Um, so even though there is a limitation, it's not really they're still not fully committed to the the their human rights commitments and promoting peace if they're exporting the vehicles which carry other countries guns um, yeah. i would say yeah, that's a fair point it's always uh, there's always um, a discussion on where to draw the line yeah so like where do you think this distance comes from um like nina us that earlier as well uh, as part of her question where Europe is on the one hand exporting arms and the other it's a promoter of peace economic welfare trade etc do you think this is because of well, vested interest in government because of lobbying in the European Parliament as some people would make out some European parliamentarians would make out or is it a general cultural thing or where does it where does this come from um Again, I think there are a few um, few different answers possible, um, and and uh, I cannot look into the boardrooms of these um, companies, so it's, it's a bit hard for me to, uh, to be uh, specific about. But one of the analysis that I think is um, credible is that if you look at Europe, there are um, many um, companies making similar products. So you have a few different. Um, Producers of fighter jets in, in only within Europe. We have a few uh, different producers of uh, military helicopters, uh, and the same for all kind of uh, major conventional arms. Um, and to make sure that this development is, um, 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 how do you say, uh, um, it makes in the end money, you have to export. Uh, because if you only, um, if you, for example, an Italian company, and you can only sell to um, um, to Italy because there is also a French helicopter uh, made by France and a Dutch helicopter made by the Dutch. You cannot um, sell enough within Europe um, um, to make sure that all the investment that you need to make a, a good military helicopter um, uh, and, and make a profit, you have to export. Um, and the same goes for all the other different uh, conventional arms. So the fact that um, the European um, arms industry is um, scattered and still a bit in the domestic silos, um, you have to export. Otherwise, you can't make a profit with uh, with the arms exp uh, with the uh, with the arms manufacturing. Well, if you um, try to um, harmonize it a bit better, so for example, you decide uh, we'll make. Um, the France will make the vessels, in, the, in Italy they will make uh, the helicopters, and uh, in Sweden they will make the fighter jets, and then you can sell within Europe. It might be possible to, um, to be less dependent on, uh, on arms exports. But of course, it's something that's, that's hard to do. So until now, um, you have to export, otherwise it's, it's impossible to, um, to produce um, like really um, innovative um, and powerful um, conventional arms. Interesting. You'd think that it um, could just be fully subsidized by the government um, as just part of the military. But, yeah, but I guess you have, to, you have to use public money. It's really expensive. So you have to decide uh, not to spend it on, uh, I don't know, um, education, but more on, uh, on the military. That's, that is a decision also. Mm. And, but of course, it's a difficult decision for, uh, yeah. Then you still have like, I mean, just to compare, you've got American companies which are subsidized by their government for the majority, but then still export their arms all across the world as well. Um, yeah. The other day I saw an infographic which said, yeah, essentially every country on earth receives um, American arms, even if it's indirectly. Um, so regardless, it wouldn't make much of a difference, um, even if there was more funding. Um, Anna asked a question kind of a bit related to what I was just saying, uh, which is how much influence the US have in European arms exports. Um, is there pressure from the United States to continue selling weapons? Or is it, again, self-interest of the countries or even of the companies um, you mentioned? It's 
on the one hand, you say it's about profit, but could there also be this pressure of um, the, the states to be involved in its wires and to help maintain allies? Um, um, uh, definitely, there is. There is apart from uh, making a profit. There's also the the political, geopolitical, and uh, diplomatic um, perspective on uh, on arms exports. Um, um, so, for example, arms uh, are it, it's a way to um, um, to buy loyalty. If you are a rich state and you buy somewhere. Uh, you buy, for example, as the Netherlands, we bought fighter jets from the United States, the F-35, the new uh, new big fighter jet. Um, because the Netherlands is really, they have a history of, uh, of a strong uh, focus on the US and uh, the NATO, etc. Um, and that, it, of course, there, there's um, diplomacy and, uh, and political um, um, dynamics uh, in place. Um, so yeah, um, I, 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 <clears throat> it's always it, it's difficult to um, to be specific about this because I um, it's been a while since there have been many cables uh, leaked to uh, to WikiLeaks, and uh, uh, until uh, you have this new big leak, it's really hard to um, to find out um, what the reasons are that um, that are being discussed but that there is a geopolitical and a um, diplomatic side to arms exports that's um, that's definitely true yeah that's yeah that's quite interesting and then i'm curious as to why countries are selected for uh, let, let's say that um, european political geopolitical diplomatic interests play a role in the arms industry um one of the major ones is, of course, uh, Saudi Arabia, we've already discussed, um, several other Gulf countries, which the US and NATO want to keep as their allies. Um, also, various countries across the Middle East, North Africa, um, all of Latin America being under NATO influence, I'd say. Uh, but then you've got India, which takes the majority of its arms imports from Russia. Um, is it just unprofitable for European um, arms industry to export to India, or is it um, that there's not enough geopolitical interest there? Um, do you have any insight as to that specific case? Um, no, to be honest, I don't. I don't know exactly how the um, how um, how the Indian market is um, considered from a European perspective. I know that the UK has quite some. Um, arms deals with uh, with India uh, recently. Um, I mean, with Brexit, they have to take what they can get from the former Commonwealth. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it's uh, it's a historical. Uh, yeah, that probably has to do with history as well. Um, but I, I so I, I don't know exactly how um, um, how Europe considers India as a destination for arms. Um, but it's true they have um, they they um, they import a lot from uh, from other other countries. Yeah, Russia is often a bit more a bit less expensive, so uh, that can be one reason for for India to uh, to go shopping somewhere else. I'm sure that if they uh, if they if they look for a military helicopter, they are welcome to uh, to come to uh, Italy if they want to buy some. But um, I don't know why that doesn't happen at the moment. Um, yeah, that's fair enough. Um, I mean, different topic again. Um, Oscar just commented that the European Parliament has passed three different non-binding resolutions uh, urging the Council to impose an arms embargo to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia due to its actions in Yemen. Um, but all three of those are non-binding resolutions, Oscar. Um, I mean, if you're here in the, the chat, I'm curious. Um, well, also for you, Ludo, whether this even has any impact. Um, if yeah, it's I think just political always, pressure or... I think every resolution is non-binding. I think it's it's typical for um, for the European Parliament to... You can make uh, resolutions and um, they often sound very um, promising. Um, but you always rely on uh, the European Commission to... Uh, um, 
yeah this uh, yeah. the, the way the that they, you were something uh, um do you think that that um that will have a point that they'll be uh yeah impactful if the, if those in, in resolutions have been placed um i'm a bit skeptical but i'm also i'm not a I'm not an ex I'm not an expert in uh, expert on uh, European politics. Um, what I've seen um, for uh, the um, um, the arms industry, they have a powerful lobby, um, and they are um, they know who to talk to, and they talk to a lot of people in um, in Europe. So it's really hard to um, to make progress um, into a direction of more responsible um, arms export. Uh, but nonetheless, it's uh, it's possible, and I think the resolution that was adopted last September, um, suggested by uh, or, or um, directed by uh, Hanna Neumann, is a good example. Uh, one of the um, one of the elements of the resolution was to have at least a um, common way to um, um, archive and report on our arms exports within the European Union, um, so that at least you can compare um uh, easily how um, different european member states are exporting arms um until then everybody had their own system and it was really difficult to uh, to make something out of it and and, and comparing was uh, almost impossible but this was in the resolution and um, um it was accepted and implemented already so now it's possible to um um to to um uh, look around in a European database and find exactly what the different European member states were exporting to what country. Well, not exactly uh, in general terms. So you, you never find out what uh, what company sold what exactly to what country, but at least you have a general understanding of the destinations of European uh, European arms. Mm. Um, so having spoken specifically about the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the arms embargoes, um, is this reflective of the general um, trend when you were researching this um, to to arms exports of the Europe globally. Um, it's a it's a difficult question, um, but um, is there is there similar incentive to stop exports to other countries? Essentially, yeah, similar because um, one of your reports on the website was about Italian arms uh, exports to Turkmenistan, uh, well, among the third worst for press freedom, humanitarian, um, and various other indices. Um, yeah. So is there similar pressure for other dictatorial authoritarian countries? Uh, no, I think it's harder um, because um, if there's no um, hot direct violence, it's more um, it's more complicated to um, to raise public awareness uh, and to involve NGOs and uh, and to influence public opinion. So um, it, it, it's for example Turkmenistan. It's really hard to uh, um, to mo mobilize um, um, against um, export to this country because there's no um, like direct violence. And also, if you want to um, make a legal case. Um, it's really hard um, to make a strong case if you can't refer to uh, direct violence. But I think with Yemen, um, it was on such a huge scale, and there was also um, so many examples of, uh, of violence that were really visible, really easy, not really easy, but uh, very doable to, uh, to document. Um, that, made, that made it pretty specific. And there are, I think, many really questionable destinations for, um, for European arms, where it's a lot harder to, um, to make a powerful case against uh, these exports. Mm. Yeah. So in that way, Yemen is, a, um, is an exception. Yeah. You said it was also triggered by Khashoggi in particular, in terms of the Dutch and German well, halts on arms exports. It was specific in the German case, yeah. 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 So if there was a specific case like that, perhaps it could trigger it, um, such yeah. as with Navalny in Russia, you had the exactly. influence yeah. another. In, uh, in, uh, in Italy, you have, there was a student who uh, was killed, I think, seven years ago mm. uh, when, he, when he was studying in, uh, in Cairo. And it, it's, um, 
that yeah. makes it a lot more uh, complicated for Italian companies to um, uh, justify their arms exports to um, to Egypt. So these these kind of country specific incidents, um, yeah, can be uh, can in a way be um, instrumentalized for um, uh, discussing uh, arms exports. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, various purposes. Although it's quite depressing if this is your only way forward uh, with with these matters, I, I yeah. would hope there's a better way. Um, yeah, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask um, for one of the final questions: uh, whether you have any particular case which, during your research, um, popped out to to you um, for with regard to European ministerialization. Um, is there any? particular corrupt or particular and particularly intense um, well yeah example that you came across during your research um, for regarding European arms exports um, or particularly no, memorable case, in general sorry yeah I think the cases with um, military planes are uh, really interesting because th these are among the most complex systems so it means there are a lot a lot of companies also cross-border uh, involved. Um, so if you, if there is an issue with a military plane, then it immediately makes uh, makes clear how um, how politics are run in in Europe. So when um, um, you had these um, tornado fighter jets who are um, made in in Germany, but with a lot of parts uh, made in France, for example, um, and when um, and the same with the uh, with the follow up with the, the typhoon fighter jet it may be even a better example because the um, tornado is a bit old uh, so the typhoon is made by many companies also german companies uh, when germany decided not to sell anymore to saudi arabia it meant that it was basically impossible to finish the deals on the on the fighter jet the the typhoon uh, which was a problem for the um, for the french because they were still okay with uh, with selling the typhoons to um, Saudi Arabia. Um, so I think these, um, and there are, there's an, another example, which is um, a military plane by Airbus, which is also made uh, uh, by, uh, by Spain, Germany, uh, the UK. Um, so, um, and some count, in, in, well, I think if you're interested in, in arms exports and especially their political, um, um, political perspective on, the, on arms export, then you have to look into um, the Typhoon or the A400M as two planes to um, uh, to follow. Um, so also because, because the, the Typhoon, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, but so because the final um, part in the in the product, so the final product was made in Germany, the the exports of the Typhoon stopped essentially. Yeah, well, not not the assembly itself. I think they are assembled in um, in the UK, but um, crucial elements like I think the engine. I'm, I'm not so sure about what parts exactly, but um, some crucial elements for the Typhoon is made in uh, in Germany. So if they don't deliver, yeah, it's impossible to uh, you can't you can't finish your plane. So uh, yeah, of course they found a way, and now uh, Germany says we don't sell uh, anything to Saudi Arabia unless it's part of a cross-border cooperation like the typhoon. So the typhoon still continues to be sold to, uh, to Saudi Arabia in spite of the arms export ban. Interesting. Um, for final question, um, I think we'll end it after this one. Um, I want to ask, um, since you highlighted that, um, well, these complex planes are made cross-border um, in various countries, um, do you think that could also be extended to the militaries themselves? Um, something which comes up time and time again in SIP lectures is the idea of a European army. Uh, I know that uh, one of the up and coming uh, parties, uh, Volt, uh, Volt Europa, is very in yeah. favor of the idea. Um, I'm curious whether you can see, uh, um, whether you see uh, European arms uh, cross-border cooperation in such a manner, uh, overflowing into the defense industry itself. Um, can you see a European army in the in the coming decades? Um, yeah, I can uh, I can definitely see that uh, not 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 quickly. 
um, but maybe 20, 30 years from now, I think it's uh, something I can um, I can imagine to to happen. There was until quite recently there was no defense budget in um, in the in the EU, but um, um, I think within the new budget, which was just I think um, starting in 2021, right? The they have the seven year um, budget uh, rounds. I think the new one includes uh, a 13 billion um, fund for um, a military cooperation um, mm. in Europe. So basically means um, the EU will spend money on um, cooperative military projects. And there is, there is a lot to um, wonder about uh, what that means for, for exports, for, um, for regulations, for ethical questions, etc. cetera. Uh, but it means also that the EU is... Um, progressing towards a um, at least a, a, a European strategy on the, on the military um, development um, and that's it's I mean it's not it's still a very big step to a European army but it's um, a step in the direction of um, more military um, cooperation and, har- and harmonization in uh, in Europe fascinating stuff um, all right. I think with that, we'll end the evening. Um, I wanted to thank you very much for joining us. Um, and uh, yeah, for answering all of our questions or my questions in particular and uh, having the discussion with us. Um, yeah. Thank you. I hope it was, uh, was helpful. Absolutely. I found it very interesting myself and I hope everyone else here did as well. Um, yeah. Right. And- um, I wanted to say that it's probably a very hard time to be a student. So I wish you all um, a lot of uh, patience in these um, boring, boring times. Mm. Probably a few months from now, we'll all have a bit more freedom to uh, enjoy our student life. But I can imagine that it's it's challenging uh, once in a while. So um, um, good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I thought I'd say the snow makes it a little bit more enjoyable at the moment. <laughs> yeah, that's a gift, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, with that, I'll end the live stream as well. Uh, if anyone's on YouTube, you can feel free to switch to the Zoom stream. Um, I'll still have some announcement afterwards, but uh, um, you won't have to. Oh, 